Good morning. If you have difficulty getting in, Mr. Farnsworth, we apologize for that. We're glad that you're with us. There's a quorum is now present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled National Security in Latin America, Challenges and Opportunities on Energy Cooperation, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements, and without objection, that's so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record, again, without objection, so ordered. Well, again, uh, good morning and thank all of you for uh, joining us here today. Today we're going to conduct some oversight of the United States national security policy in the Western Hemisphere by exploring energy security issues in Latin America. It's a, an area that uh, I think we all agree uh, begs more attention given all that's going on in the world today and understanding how important our neighbors are. On its way to producing 30 percent of the world's gross domestic product, the United States imports enormous amounts of energy, mostly in the form of oil. One need look no further than our strategic interest and troubling history with oil exporting nations in the Middle East to recognize that petrol politics are a critical element of our national security policy. This nexus between national security and energy policy is self-evident, yet it has not received a commensurate amount of attention, and integrating these policies is vital to our national security interest. Two former directors of the CIA, John Deutsch and James Schlesinger, have leveled significant criticism of the United States approach. In their 2006 report entitled National Security Consequences of US, U.S. Oil Dependency, they concluded, over many years in administrations, the United States government has failed to pay sufficient attention to energy in its conduct of foreign policy or to adopt a consistent approach to energy issues. The result is that energy matters typically appear on the foreign policy agenda as a surprise, usually in times of crisis or as the unexpected consequence of other foreign policy actions. Retired military leaders and other prominent businessmen have also called for a more integrative approach to our nation's energy and foreign policy. In their 2006 report, Recommendations for the Nation on Reducing U.S. Oil Dependence, the Energy Security Leadership Council summarized by saying, put simply, the reliable and affordable supply of energy, energy security, is an increasingly prominent feature of the international political landscape and bears on the effectiveness of U.S. foreign policy. At the same time, however, the United States has largely continued to treat energy policy as something that is separate and distinct, substantively and organizationally, from foreign policy. This must change. The United States needs not merely to coordinate but to integrate energy issues with its foreign policy. The Deutsch-Schlesinger Report had a number of recommendations going forward. They noted, for example, that the United States should increase efficiency of oil and gas use and switch from oil-derived products to alternatives. Because of the national security challenges in the Middle East, they also recommend that the United States government should, and I quote, encourage supply of oil from sources outside the Persian Gulf. Latin America's substantial energy reserves supply 28 percent of the U.S. petroleum imports and 95 percent of our natural gas imports. The Middle East, by contrast, currently provides 17 percent of U.S. oil imports. We have invited a panel of energy and security experts to be with us here today to examine all the issues surrounding energy in Latin America and to ask what challenges exist for the United States national security and what opportunities can our country take advantage of to maximize Western hemispheric energy supplies to improve our relations with our Latin American neighbors and to strengthen our national security. As noted by the title for this hearing, our energy relationship with Latin America is filled with both challenges and opportunities. Done correctly, I'm hopeful that we can turn existing challenges into opportunities and create win-win situations. Mexico's government, for instance, instance, predicts that it will run out of oil reserves within eight years. As the second largest supplier of foreign oil to the United States, how will Mexico's potential oil production crises affect U.S. national security? How will Mexico's diminishing oil reserves affect Mexico itself? Mexico relies on revenues from its oil to fund much of its government work. What will happen when this revenue dries up, and what can the United States do now to help? Venezuela, the fourth largest supplier of foreign oil to the United States, is also experiencing diminishing oil production. Political tensions in the region, highlighted by the recent military posturing between Venezuela and Colombia and the volatile relations between Venezuela and the United States, present significant additional challenges. How should the United States approach these sets of challenges? Looking beyond oil, Latin America holds tremendous potential and opportunities for non-traditional sources of energy. Brazil is already the world's second largest producer of ethanol, trailing only the, the United States. With oil prices above $100 per barrel, the market for ethanol is growing, and many Latin American countries are well positioned to take advantage of this growth by creating their own resource-efficient production. 
Many Latin American countries are also ideally positioned to capitalize on growing demand for solar and wind energy. As we grapple with impending consequences of climate changes, we must ask ourselves how our foreign policy can encourage positive developments in Latin America's non-traditional energy sector. A foreign policy that carefully considers energy security could help meet the energy demand of the United States, grow the economies of Latin American countries in ways that benefit all the people of those countries, and help stem the flow of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. All of these critical questions are things that we look forward to hearing from, uh, from our distinguished panel of experts. And now I would like to recognize Mr. Shays for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing. The issue of Western Hemisphere is especially timely in light of the recent events in Colombia and Ecuador. <coughs> President Bush, in his 2006 State of the Union speech, stated our problem very clearly. America is addicted to oil. Access to reliable and plentiful energy is directly related to our economic prosperity and to our national security. The sad reality, however, is that many of the world's leading oil-producing nations are either politically unstable or, in some cases, at serious odds with the United States or both. We must recognize the role played by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, re referred to as OPEC. OPEC members produce 40 percent of the world's oil and hold 80 percent of proven reserves. OPEC nations are the strategic pivot of world politics and the global economy. And they know it. Two Latin American nations, Venezuela and Ecuador, are members of OPEC. In recent years, our engagement in Latin America has been constrained by governments which express hostility towards the United States. Some also appear to have ties to terrorist organizations. This presents a tangible threat to our energy supply and our national security. For this reason, we should be paying more attention to this critical region. But we cannot talk about hemispheric energy resources without discussing the political challenges facing Latin America. The United States has two obligations. One, we, Congress, and the administration must step up efforts to promote conservation and diversification of energy sources. Congress must continue to find a commitment to research and investment in alternative fuels. Two, we must also continue to work with our partners in the hemisphere to ensure political and economic stability, as well as respect for the rule of law in each nation. I thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I hope we will have the opportunity to hear from administrative witnesses in the future. This would enable us to better determine how the executive branch is addressing the geopolitics of the Western Hemisphere. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this vital hearing, and, and thank you again as well to our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Shays. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses that are before us here today. I want to begin by introducing them. Today we welcome uh, David L. Goldwyn, as President of Goldwyn International Strategies, LLC, an international energy consulting firm. He's a senior fellow in the energy program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and serves on the Council of Foreign Relations Task Force on Energy Security and the Council's Center for Preventative Action Task Forces on Angola, Venezuela, and Bolivia. Mr. Goldwyn served as Assistant Secretary of Energy for International Affairs, Counselor to the Secretary of Energy and National Security Deputy to United Nations Ambassador Bill Richardson. Mr. Goldwyn also served in the Office of the Undersecretary for Political Affairs at the State Department under President George H.W. Bush and President Clinton, acting as Chief of Staff from 1993 to 1997. Mr. Paulo Sotero is the director of the Brazil Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Inst Center, a nonpartisan institute that fosters research, study, discussion, and collaboration among a full spectrum of individuals concerned with policy and scholarship and national and world affairs. For the past 17 years, Mr. Sotero was the Washington correspondent for Estado de Sao Paulo, a leading Brazilian daily newspaper. Since 2003, he has been an adjunct lecturer at Georgetown University both in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and in the Center for Latin American Studies of the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. Mr. Sotero is also co-author of a recent article examining how Brazil can use its environmental assets as an element of soft power to assert its role in the world. Mr. Ray Walzer is a senior policy analyst for Latin America at the Heritage Foundation. He's a 27-year veteran foreign service officer with the State Department assigned to Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Nicaragua. He has also served as director of the Program of Western Hemisphere Area Studies at the Foreign Service Institute from 2005 to 2007. Dr. Walzer has, uh, was also a visiting professor of international relations and Latin American politics at the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. 
And Eric Farnsworth is the Vice President of the Council of Americas, an international business organization consisting of companies representing a broad spectrum of sectors. Mr. Farnsworth is also on the Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy of the United States Department of State and recently co-authored the article, Rediscovering the New World, which addressed how the next United States President should approach relations with Latin America. I want to welcome all of you here this morning. It's the policy of the subcommittee to swear you in before you testify, so I ask if you'd all please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will please reflect that all have answered in the affirmative. I, again, appreciate all of you being here this morning. Your statements are going to be placed on the record uh, without objective, so you need not feel compelled to read the entire statement. <laughs> Even Mr. Goldwyn, who I mentioned earlier was about this big, <laughs> it has rendered the, uh, everybody up here blind uh, on that, but it was informative, so it was worth the, uh, worth the read on that. We give uh, five minutes for opening statements. You'll see with one minute remaining, the amber light will come on, uh, then the red light comes on after that. We understand that you might go a bit over. We want you to finish your thought uh, and your sentence or whatever, um, but it, uh, please try to keep it as close as you can on that so that all the witnesses can get their testimony in and we can have a good dialogue back and forth. Mr. Chairman, I'd like the record to, to note that you have a switch with a trap door where the witnesses, when they <laughs> see five minutes, they just disappear. Exactly. <laughs> Mr. Goldman, would you please uh, open with your remarks? Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. for uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Mr. Goldman? Ah, that's better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your attention to this issue. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My apologies for the small print. As my colleague helpfully suggested, I was reducing my carbon footprint by uh, using smaller print and fewer pages. Uh, this issue, uh, national security uh, and energy, uh, is extremely important. And uh, in my mind, there's no question that today the United States is more energy insecure than any time since 1975. Uh, our dependence on oil and the dependence of our allies and our friends is a huge strategic vulnerability. Uh, it frays coalitions when we try and do things on Sudan, which I know, Mr. Chairman, you've paid attention to, uh, but also on nonproliferation, on terrorism. Uh, it enriches our adversaries and competitors, and, and with that enormous uh, oil wealth, they can act with impunity towards their own people and also towards their neighbors. Um, it makes energy markets more fragile because the wealthier countries get, the more they want to sit on their oil rather than produce it, and it makes prices volatile and, and puts our economies at risk. Uh, we've got evidence, as you suggested, in the hemisphere. Uh, Venezuela's wealth has turned it into a competitor, and that's how I would term it, really. They're an ideological competitor. They're a competitor for influence in the region right now, and they are ability, uh, have an ability to do enormous things by the debt of their other countries, give oil and products away, and compete for political influence in a way that we are not competing with. Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador are good examples of the resource curse, and, uh, and I think cases where uh, both their countries are still poor and underdeveloped, um, and they have economic models which are likely to make them less stable, not more. This challenge is very well studied and understood. You mentioned the, the Council on Foreign Relations study. I think all the experts agree there's no such thing as energy independence. We can't drill our way out of this. There's no silver bullet. There's no one solution that's going to get us off dependence on oil. There's nothing we can do for ourselves that's going to help us be more secure unless we do it for our allies and friends as well. And because we consume, the U.S., 20 million barrels a day, the world consumes 86 million barrels a day, enormous amount of, of energy, there's no fix that's going to happen before a couple of decades. It's going to be gradual. It's going to be incremental. But um, I think uh, people also agree that we will have to deal with the existing suppliers in the interim and manage our way through. And the time to get started on this problem was yesterday. So I think that's, uh, you know, that the, the diagnosis is well established. And the key elements of a solution are outlined pretty well also. Controlling domestic demand is one. Hurrying technological change, helping the market is a second one. Integrating energy and foreign policy is a third. And then competing asymmetrically for political influence, using soft power, whatever the term is, but basically trying to make ourselves relevant to other countries in, in the region uh, uh, by, um, uh, by using our influence, our culture, uh, and political influence. But the, these solutions seem to be politically impossible to accomplish. And I want to talk about four of them really, really briefly. Demand is the key. Transportation in the United States, it's, it, oil is for transportation, 75 percent of every barrel. If we don't deal with planes, trains, and automobiles, we do not deal with this problem. And the way this problem gets fixed has been well established in Europe and Asia. They use taxes, and they already have cars that are more efficient than we even aspire to. They have cars that make 40 miles a gallon. We're only hoping for 35 by 2020, and 40 isn't even on the table. You know, and that's politically acceptable in those countries. Cafe standards that would be way higher than what we have now, that would be another way. There are other tradable permits and other economic means. But if we don't find a way 
to make it necessary or make the price of gasoline so high that alternatives are commercially viable, big money will not come into alternatives, the structure of transportation will not change, and we will not do anything on this problem. All the R&D and technology is wishful thinking and window dressing unless the price of gasoline stays, maybe not higher than where it is now, but basically can't, so it can't go below where it is right now. So that's really, that's really number one. Hurrying the technology is important. We have a lot of money in R&D. It's deployment. It's actually seeing whether these technologies can be deployed at a commercial scale. Now, venture capitalists will only do this if they think that they can make money on these alternatives for 20 and 30 years. So it goes back to price. But if we do have the right market for it, the government <coughs> can play an extremely important role in deployment and trying to accelerate technology. A third area is this integration of energy and foreign policy. And we have uh, suggestions for the wiring diagram in the Council on Foreign Relations study. But it's really a mindset that needs to change. You know, we need to, you know, to do a lot of things to look at how we make ourselves more secure. Now, one of the ways we do this is make energy high policy. We should be talking to China, president to president, about the influence of their investment policy on regional stability. We should also be talking to them about efficiency. We should also be talking to them about how they control demand in their own economy. But you can't do that at the sub-ministerial level and make any, any progress. Same thing with Europe. If we're worried about Russian monopoly and Russian dominance of Europe, we need to be talking head of state to head of state to Europe about alternate pipelines, about not being dependent on Russian gas, about efficiency in their system. <laughs> Lots of other things we ought to focus on. Conflict <laughs> resolution. You want 600,000 barrels a day? Solve the conflict in the Niger Delta. Where is that on the U.S. policy agenda? Um, collective energy security. When we built the International Energy Agency, and when we did it, it had 40 percent of the world's consumers, 60 percent of the world's consumers. Today it has 40 percent because the Chinese and the Indians aren't in. We had to bring them into our collective system rather than leaving them on the outside. Promoting tr reform and transparency, I've testified before Congressman Shays on that issue, is a way of ensuring long-term stability. And we got to use our economic power. We got to demand reciprocity from other people who are closing their markets to us while our markets are open to them. Not as a sledgehammer, but we have a free trade agreement or trade promotion authority. We ought to get something back in return. And the sugar tariff with, with Brazil is a classic example. If we want to build support in the region, bring Brazil closer, build regional security, promote jobs, create development, lifting the sugar tariff is not an issue about the corn syrup lobby. Lifting the sugar tariff is a strategic move to make ourselves more important in Latin America. But we don't treat it that way. We don't talk about it that way, and it doesn't get that kind of prominence. But that's an example of the kind of thing that, um, that we need to do. <clears throat> the last thing, and my colleagues will talk about this more than I, is we need to compete asymmetrically. We won't get countries to reverse nationalizations or to give us access to resources by saying we really, really need the oil. You know, the way we do it is we are better partners. Our model is better. And, and that means we have to talk to them about the issues they care about, which are not just drugs and terrorism, particularly in the hemisphere. We need to talk to them about development, about marginalization of societies, about poverty, because that's what has driven this move for nationalization. And if we can talk to them about their issues, and we use tools like trade promotion or free trade agreements, bilateral or regional, but also the kind of development assistance, technical assistance that matters to them, we are more important. We matter to them. We talk to them about things that are important, and they are much more likely to adopt policies that are consistent with ours. But we treat them as basically countries which ought to snap to when we have a policy in, in Iraq or someplace else, and then we kind of ignore them on the other issues, or we give them the Washington consensus, and when it doesn't work out as well as any of us hoped, you know, we're not really back to them with another model, which is why Venezuela is, is, you know, is mopping the floor with us in that region, because they've got a model, even though it's a bad one, and, we don't, and we're not competing. So we need to compete that way. Um, you know, in, in conclusion, let me just say that I understand these are all hard political issues, but the two things that you all are doing, which are really important, is speaking the truth to the American people about what it takes to get the problem fixed, and then holding our government accountable for having policies that do it. So <coughs> thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sotero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Put your microphone on, please. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. I'm grateful for the invitation, and I bring you greetings from the president of the Wilson Center, former Congressman Lee Hamilton from Indiana. We are grateful for the support the U.S. Congress provides to the work we do at the Wilson Center. Relations between the United States and Brazil reached a new level of maturity in the last two decades thanks to two historic developments. On the one hand, the consolidation of democracy and economic stability in Brazil. On the other, the end of the Cold War, which freed the Washington to rethink its policies towards the neighbors in the Americas. That is the important context in which Brazil should be viewed 
by the U.S. policymakers interested in the challenges and opportunities for energy cooperation in the Americas. Over the last uh, three decades, Brazil has established itself as a leader in the sustainable production of ethanol. This renewable fuel has replaced close to half of the national consumption of gasoline for light vehicles in the country and is a key component of the national energy matrix, which is not only the cleanest in the world, but also put Brazil on the verge of attaining energy self-sufficiency. As the graph shows, close to uh, half of all energy used in Brazil, or 44 percent, comes from clean and re renewable sources. It compares to 13 percent in the rest of the world and 6 percent in the OECD countries. Huge offshore oil and gas reserves found recently along the southern coast of Brazil will ensure self-sufficiency in approximately five years. Uh, when fully developed, which should happen in approximately 10 years, the new reserves will make Brazil both a major global oil exporter and Latin America's leading producer, supplanting both Venezuela and Mexico. The potential geopolitical implications of Brazil's success in, energy, in the energy field should not be lost to those who believe, in the, uh, who, to those who believe that the Americas should be and can be a, a space of peace, democracy, stability, and economic and social progress. Uh, I would like to focus on renewable energy. This is the topic that led Presidents Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva and George W. Bush to make clear their understanding that Brazil and the United States stand at a moment of promise and can work together to advance their own national and international interests. One year ago, during a visit to Sao Paulo, President Bush, well, by President Bush, the two leaders launched a joint initiative to promote research and development of biofuels in the Americas. Since the mid-70s, the Brazilian sugarcane industry experienced massive investments in science and technology, and both, uh, both from private and public sectors. Today, sugarcane is the basic input not only for sugar, but also for a diverse range of value-added products, particularly ethanol for cars. Just last month, ethanol consumption exceeded the use of gasoline. More than 85% of all new cars sold in Brazil, many of them built by American companies, are flex fuel. Their tanks are, can be filled with either ethanol, gasoline, or any mixture of the two in the country's 33,000 plus service stations. Sugarcane is by far the most successful and efficient feedstock for the production of biofuels. Several international studies conducted by respected institutions, including many of the United States government, have independently corroborated the, the, the environmental and economic benefits of Brazilian sugarcane ethanol. Uh, these benefits remain unmatched unmatched by any other type of biofuels produced on a commercial scale. The energy balance of Brazilian ethanol is four and a half times better than that of ethanol produced from wheat or sugar beet and almost seven times better than corn ethanol. As a result, Brazil ethanol achieves a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions of up to 90 percent compared to gasoline today. Ethanol from sugarcane also offers high productivity, higher productivity than other alternatives. New varieties of sugarcane developed for Brazil and improved processing techniques will double yields. The result is that without any increase in land use, these technological improvements can double the production of sugarcane in Brazil. Sugarcane is currently occupies only 2.3 percent of Brazil's total arable land. Half of that is dedicated to the production of ethanol. This means that uh, with about just 1% of the country arable land, Brazil has replaced nearly half of our gasoline consumption. Harvesting of sugar cane is being fast mechanized. Labor conditions for seasonal, seasonal workers uh, involved in manual harvesting have improved markedly. But as demonstrated by a recent finding by federal inspectors, of violations of labor conditions in one operation in Sao Paulo, enforcement remains key. Nearly 85% of all the sugarcane grown in, is harvested in the southern central region of Brazil. The remaining production comes from the northeast. Both regions uh, are well over 1,000 miles uh, uh, from the Amazon rainforest. 
future expansion of sugarcane production will occur in south central Brazil, particularly in the graded pastures, uh, further improving our efforts to reduce greenhouse emissions. Uh, the process of pro ethanol production has the added advantage compared with other biofuels of being a net source of electric power. Bioelectricity <coughs> is produced by burning sugarcane byproducts by gas and straw in steam boilers. The power generated for, from this process not only makes our processing mills 100% self-sufficiency sufficient, but they also sell surplus electricity into the national electricity grid. It is estimated that ge uh, generation capacity could rise to an average of as much as 15,000 megawatts by 2020 enough electricity to supply 15% of the country's electricity needs or the equivalent of electricity consumption in today's Sweden or the Netherlands. It is for these reasons, uh, the, the reasons, these reasons that Brazilians have become promoters of ethanol for themselves and for the rest of the world. Sugar cane ethanol is far superior than ethanol made from other feedstocks in terms of energy balance, environmental efficiency, productivity, and cost effectiveness. Uh, its production should be expanded and international trade encouraged. There is ample room for such expansion uh, of production and trade beyond Brazil. Uh, maybe more than 100 developing countries have the conditions to do this, to, to be engaged. Sugarcane ethanol has all the prerequisites to become a global commodity. This will not happen, however, until developed countries, starting with the United States, abandon the perverse logic now in place, which raises barrier for the trading of biofuels and allow fossil fuels-based products to move freely around the globe unimpeded by trade or any other barriers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sotero. Uh, Dr. Welser. Am I, am I on now? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I represent, uh, well, I come from the Heritage Foundation, but uh, the views I express today are uh, essentially my own and do not represent any official position of the Heritage Foundation. Yeah, I'm not sure that you are on or you might have to draw it closer to you. Okay, thank you. It's, it's just, this is sort of my virgin appearance. That's all right. Before, uh, These microphones can be a little tricky <laughs> on people. Thank you. In my first appearance before Congress, I have to sort of get over my, uh, my jitters here. But uh, thank you for having me today, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I would agree with Mr. Uh, Golwin that energy security begins at home. Uh, in the testimony that I have prepared, I've raised a couple of uh, points. Heritage has taken very strong views on the importance of market-based solutions, further exploration, uh, looking at such uh, undertakings as, uh, as nuclear uh, energy, uh, tapping the shale reserves of Colorado and the like. So I won't, I won't go further into that area. It is not my area of particular expertise. First of all, I think the United States is very fortunate to have two solid, reliable energy suppliers as our NAFTA partners. Uh, North America, uh, we do remain energy interdependent, and I think both Canada and, and Mexico recognize this. As long as we stick with our NAFTA commitments, as long as we recognize that a prosperous Canada and a more prosperous Mexico are in our national interest, we can have strong confidence in our capacity to work with our neighbors north and to the south. Uh, clearly, the oil sands of Alberta uh, hold an immense amount of uh, recoverable petroleum. Uh, yes, they're Extraction and production costs are higher, uh, but this is certainly a very promising area of development. It is my understanding that some of the linkages between the U.S. and the Canada, particularly pipelines and transmission, uh, electrical transmission lines, are areas that need uh, some attention and uh, considerable updating. The petroleum situation in Mexico, as pointed out in numerous reports, is less rosy. Uh, March 18th will mark the 70th anniversary of oil nationalization in Mexico, and Mexicans will celebrate the event. Yet overall, Mexicans may have little, re little reason to be jubilant. Uh, as all of the witnesses point out, Mexico's production is, uh, is reaching decline, uh, as you made uh, <coughs> a reference to in your opening remarks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clearly, the, the Mexicans believe that there is a considerable amount of uh, reserves to recover, something in the order of about 100 billion barrels of various categories of reserves. <coughs> uh, 
sufficient, uh, according to the Mexican uh, Energy Secretary, uh, for 60 years of meeting Mexico's needs. But getting to it is increasingly costly. Uh, Pemex is short on capital. It clearly needs uh, strategic partners uh, to move forward. Uh, the problem is that the Mexican Constitution, of course, prevents uh, any foreign ownership or participation or even domestic uh, participation uh, in oil exploration. At this point, we cannot, I think that Mexico is waking up to this fact. Uh, uh, will it wake up fast enough? Hard to tell. Uh, we cannot alter Mexico's, uh, what considers a sovereign decision, but we can continue to demonstrate a constructive approach to bilateral relations and promote a favorable climate uh, for future energy cooperation. One of the pieces of legislation that is before Congress these days, the Merida Initiative to deal with counter uh, narcotics threat can help to set uh, a very important, uh, or can send a very, by participating in this, can send a very important uh, uh, message to our colleagues or friends to the South. I will not say anything more, add to Mr. Sotero's uh, statement as to the importance of Brazil. It is a giant, it is growing, we have to pay attention to it. Uh, I concur with the other two witnesses that removing the 54 cent uh, per gallon tariff on Brazilian ethanol can have a catalytic effect on U.S.-Brazilian relations. Uh, it can encourage Brazilians and others to uh, invest in research on uh, promising second generation biofuels <coughs> such as uh, cellulosic uh, ethanol, and it could perhaps uh, bring us a little closer together uh, in dealing with international trade talks uh, in, the, in the Doha round. Uh, final comment, I have uh, extensive remarks regarding Mr. Chavez. I presume that he will uh, be discussed in the uh, discussion session. That he is mopping the floor with the uh, United States, well, yes, if you spend the sorts of money that he has, is using his, uh, uh, his oil revenues as a kind of massive ATM machine for domestic spending to prop up the Castroite communist regime in Cuba to purchase influence uh, in Petro Caribe and uh, acquire Russian arms, uh, yes, he has a lot of money. And I think that money if, that he's throwing around uh, is, is sort of the, uh, the key. He's also engaging in a considerable uh, acts of, of self-containment. You can see the reaction to his engagement with the FARC in Colombia, his interventions in Peru, uh, and elsewhere. So he, in some respects, uh, is uh, his own worst enemy. The, I think we have a dilemma uh, ahead of us. I think that Mr. Chavez uh, at home is increasingly less popular. He runs into some very serious uh, domestic issues. Uh, the failure of the constitutional referendum uh, in 2007 gave hope to the opposition circles uh, that the Venezuelans may be able to select new leadership in 2012. Uh, what we have to be very careful is that in designing a policy to deal with Venezuela, that we try to avoid alienating the Venezuelan people who are going to be around, uh, and hopefully our friends in a post-Chavez world. Uh, clearly. Uh, as our colleague said, there is no silver bullet. What we can do is to uh, continue to work for uh, democratic developments, constitutional governments, rule of law. Uh, we should definitely continue to strengthen our ties with the passage of pending free trade agreements with Colombia and Panama. And we should not move forward uh, into a protectionist stance, which will probably be the most harmful uh, national policy decision we could make vis-a-vis -vis the Western Hemisphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Farnsworth. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee. I'm really pleased to be here with you today, very honored by, by the uh, invitation. Uh, as you know, and as we've already discussed, uh, the United States as the world's top energy consumer um, depends on a stable and secure supply of energy at, on a cost-effective basis. And given this reality, I fully agree with the opening statements that both of you made. Uh, in terms of the strategic importance of, um, of um, energy and how it needs to be integrated into the overall foreign policy uh, aspects of the United States. In the Western Hemisphere, Mr. Chairman, it has abundant energy resources. We've discussed that a little bit. In fact, after the Middle East, our hemisphere has the second largest global production capability. Nations in the Western Hemisphere that are rich in natural resources are in some cases using the opportunity to develop their resource endowments in a manner that leads to broad-based economic growth and poverty reduction, and so the potential for true partnership in the Western Hemisphere, we believe, is readily apparent. 
What's not apparent at this time, however, is the means by which Latin America will be able to draw the massive direct foreign investment that's needed to maximize exploration and production of their natural resources. The United States is well poised to provide such investment in the form of private sector-led initiatives and expertise, but countries in the region must also do their part by creating stable and transparent investment climates. In this regard, countries such as Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Peru, and Trinidad and Tobago have made important reforms to their energy sectors. Other countries have gone the other way, taking steps that have dissuaded investment, therefore reducing their own prospects in the global economy. Within this framework, let me note a couple points if I can. We've discussed a lot of these issues already, so I'm just going to be very brief, but let me start closest to home in North America. Uh, North America, as we've discussed, is the most important energy region for the United States, which is often overlooked because Canada and Mexico are two of our closest friends. Stable democracies, which are joined to us through NAFTA and a multitude of other linkages. It's important, I believe, that we not take these relationships for granted, either in energy or more broadly. <coughs> Canada and Mexico are consistently among the top three exporters of energy to the United States. Canada is the world's second largest proven oil reserves after Saudi Arabia, of course, the vast majority of those are in the oil sands deposits. Canada is also a large producer of natural gas and supplies most of the natural gas imported to the United States. In the electricity sector, we're closely linked through trade and integrated networks. For its part, Mexico is a huge energy producer in the Western Hemisphere, although Mexico's production levels have begun to decline, as we've already discussed. Mexican officials believe that their nation enjoys substantial undiscovered gas reserves. Uh, but greater investments required to confirm and take advantage of these reserves to the extent they in fact exist. We've already talked about the oil reserves that exist in the deep water and other places. Such investment, we believe, is actually urgent. Incredibly, at this time, Mexico actually imports natural gas from the United States despite having massive potential reserves. Uh, because of their investment climate, they're actually importing from the United States, and that has a huge impact on national budgets and balance of payments. Several mechanisms have deepened North American energy cooperation. NAFTA, of course, opened energy trade among the three countries by eliminating tariffs and restrictions on the quantity of imports. As well, the Trilateral Security and Prosperity Partnership that was created in 2005 uh, was designed to increase cooperation and information sharing among the three countries in North America. Energy is a part of that dialogue, and we strongly believe that it should continue. Uh, much has been done, but much remains to be done. U.S. energy security is inextricably linked to its two neighbors, and greater progress must be made to harmonize regulations and standards and to improve infrastructure. As well, as has already been discussed, Mexican officials will need to find ways, consistent with their constitution and laws, to reform their energy sector to draw the increased foreign investment that's needed to increase reserves and set the Mexican economy on a course for greater development over time. Brazil, as we've also heard, is an emerging player in hemispheric energy markets, and Secretary of State Rice's pending trip there later this week offers the opportunity to highlight a number of important advances. Of course, Brazil is at the forefront of developing renewable energy, and we've heard a lot about that, and I would simply uh, uh, affiliate myself with those comments in terms of alternative energy. In addition, by working with Central American and Caribbean countries to help them develop or advance biofuel production cap capacity, the United States and Brazil are working to promote development in these countries and decrease their dependence on traditional fuels. So what we have is U.S. collaboration with Brazil working in conjunction with willing partners in Central America and the Caribbean to develop energy partnerships which will benefit all parties. And I think this is a wonderful example of ways that collaboration along areas of specific and tangible interest can pay real benefits and address some of the issues that we're seeing in terms of challenges to the United States and the hemisphere from other countries uh, that we've already uh, discussed just a little bit. Of course, I'll be the fourth and final member of the committee to call for the elimination of the, or reduction of the U.S. tariff on sugar-based ethanol. Uh, we believe that's an important aspect as well. Outside of biofuels, Brazil is also an important producer of oil, although most of its oil is consumed domestically. This may change. We've heard, uh, of course, about the fines just recently in the very, or the ultra-deep water off Brazil. Um, but um, one thing to note is that because of the uh, location, extraction is extremely difficult and costly, and the results there are not yet guaranteed. But these very promising developments are well worth watching. Very quickly, if I may, on the Andean region, um, which of course includes the only two members of OPEC in the Western Hemisphere we've discussed, this offers perhaps the greatest contrast <coughs> in terms of what's really going on in the Western Hemisphere. Energy politics in the Andean region, I think, encapsulates very much what's going on more broadly in the Western Hemisphere. Colombia and Peru, for example, offer examples of nations which desire foreign investment and have taken appropriate steps 
to attract it. Um, we believe that that will um, increase uh, to the extent that the U.S. Free Trade Agreement with Colombia is voted on and goes forward. On the other side of the ledger, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela have taken steps to assert a much more significant role, state role, over their respective energy sectors, steps which have directly or indirectly reduced the appetite of investors to participate in those markets. And really, that's a shame, because the region is poor, and it's in desperate need of, its, of additional resources for development. But without the ability to explore, develop, and sell resources at top prices into tight global markets, it's the people of the region, we believe, not international oil and gas companies or investors, who are paying the true long-term cost of the resource nationalism that is sweeping parts of the region. So let me leave it at that. Thank you again for the opportunity, and I look forward to your question. Thank you, Mr. Founders. Thank all of you for your testimony here this morning. Uh, we have votes going on now? Uh, we have a period of time here. Maybe we can get some uninterrupted uh, dialogue going back and forth. Mr. Braley, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. Uh, coming from a state uh, that I represent, Iowa, which has been at the forefront of the renewable energy explosion in this country, and uh, given that today is the day we are voting on a resolution honoring the 150th anniversary of the Iowa State University of Science and Technology, which has been instrumental in training and educating a lot of people from Latin America over the last century. Um, this is a, an issue that's very important to me. Um, one of the things that's also important to me is what type of progress we've been making in democratic reforms throughout Latin America. Um, I remember about 30 years ago writing a research paper on the role of the CIA and IT&T in the overthrow of the Allende regi regime in Chile. And so I'm going to ask all of my panelists, all the panelists here to comment on a portion of Mr. Goldwyn's written statement where he said what the United States lacks is a positive agenda in the hemisphere, one that recognizes the need to improve education and infrastructure, addresses the negative social impact of trade liberalization, and offers the respect and cooperation of the U.S. to these countries that work with us. And Mr. Goldwyn, since you are the author of that remark, I'm going to ask your other panelists to comment on that first and then come back to you. But what I'd like to ask you all is first, do you agree with his assessment? And second, if so, what do you th why do you think the U.S. currently lacks this positive agenda? We can draw straws. <laughs> Well, I'd be happy to start. Thank you very much. And if I could just note that my father actually attended Iowa State University, and I was born in Ames. So I appreciate the, uh, the uh, plug uh, and congratulate <coughs> Iowa State for the wonderful work that they do. I would think that uh, these comments are in general accurate um, as to why uh, that may be the case. Uh, the way that U.S. domestic um, issues are developed oftentimes have unintended consequences for the Western Hemisphere that are not seen in the same way that we uh, perhaps see the issues ourselves. And let me just give you three or four very quick examples. One is U.S. immigration reform discussions, seen one way in Washington or on the United States side of the border, seen completely differently in the Western here, Hemisphere. Trade policy discussions, seen one way in Washington, seen completely differently in Colombia, Peru, Panama, other countries. Uh, let us discuss, for example, uh, the whole idea of NAFTA, um, seen one way in this side of the border, seen another way in Canada and Mexico. And so these discussions that are very, very complicated domestically, politically, we view them as is normal in a domestic political sense, but we don't necessarily have the same uh, understanding of how those issues or appreciation of how those issues play in the Western Hemisphere. And I think that there are a number of very positive steps that the United States has been taking in the Western Hemisphere on a bipartisan basis. The uh, passage of the Peru Trade Agreement in December, I think, is a wonderful example of bipartisan uh, collaboration along those lines. Uh, we've been working very closely with some of our partners on the security uh, discussions. Uh, the Merida Initiative has come up, and that's mm -hmm. uh, one way to um, advance these discussions excuse me, further, uh, and there's a bill, a bipartisan bill that's been introduced into Congress in terms of increasing the amount of direct foreign assistance and development s assistance for the Western Hemisphere, and I, th I think that should be very seriously considered as well. Um, I don't think that there is a um, necessarily a, um, a, a, you know, a, a determination to undercut Latin America or not to collaborate with Latin America or, or to not um, uh, appreciate Latin America, but it's simply um, until we raise these issues in the overall discussions of our foreign policy, including on the energy side, I don't think we'll have necessarily the appreciation of how our domestic uh, policies are actually impacting the region and how we can mitigate perhaps the negative impressions and negative effects of, of those uh, aspects. 
Dr. Walzer. Okay. A couple of comments. I think that the uh, I'm not a representative of the Bush administration. Uh, I was a former State Department employee up until uh, uh, up until last year, so I guess I still have a certain affinity for the Department of State and the, the official views. But the Bush administration, I think, has done a reasonably good job. It has introduced the Millennium Challenge account, in the, which uh, is designed to uh, program assistance to performance. Uh, that clearly the problems there oftentimes seem to be implementation of compacts and, and the funding. I think that overall aid increases have been substantial under the Bush administration. Uh, again, this is in a very tough resource environment. I think that the desire of the administration and probably most in Congress is to provide more assistance to Latin America, particularly targeting those, those areas that were highlighted in the President's trip last, last March, which is the social agenda. Uh, it, it definitely cries for more U.S. assistance, but a creative uh, approach rather than just sort of throwing money uh, at the problem. Clearly, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, free trade agreements going ahead with uh, the Colombia and uh, Panama free trade agreements will be a very positive sign that we are indeed a uh, reliable partner. Uh, and uh, I think that clearly we need to to utilize American assistance in the future to assist to ad address the social agenda, but to also look at areas of Latin American competitiveness, uh, to look at educational reform, to look at the sorts of things that particularly, say, Andres Oppenheimer talks about is the need to try to capitalize on the current overall economic growth in Latin America, but to make it more competitive, more prepared to uh, meet the challenges of a globalized uh, world. And there's a lot of work to be done uh, in the next administration. I think this administration has done a reasonably good job, uh, but there's plenty more to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Mr. Burton, you're recognized for five minutes. First of all, let me apologize, Mr. Chairman, for being late. I had another meeting I had to go to, but, uh, and I hope I'm not redundant in what my comments are uh, that I'm going to make. Uh, obviously, uh, South America and uh, uh, Central America and Mexico are very, very important as far as our energy resources are concerned. Uh, we're also, as, as my colleague said, I just read his notes, uh, are very dependent on uh, the Middle East as well as all OPEC uh, countries. But the thing that bothers me is that we continue to depend so much on uh, foreign oil to the detriment of the United States. And I think it's extremely important that we start thinking uh, in a more realistic way. When we talk about alternative energy sources, and this is not the subject of this hearing, but when we talk about that, uh, we're talking about something that's going to take place maybe 5, 10, 15 years down the road. We don't know how long it's going to take for us to make the transition to the non-intercombustible non uh, non engine. Uh, so it's going to take some time. And our dependency on foreign oil from countries like Venezuela, Chavez, and Mexico, which may or may not be a stable country in the future, we just don't know, uh, as well as OPEC it, it, with the problems we have in the Middle East, are things that really concern me. And it seems to me that one of the things we ought to be doing while we try to make this transition to more environmentally safe energy sources and uh, move toward energy independence is to realize that we have to start doing something to protect ourselves now. And that means that we ought to be considering drilling in the Anwar. I've been up there. We can do it in an environmentally safe way, and we can get one to two million barrels of oil a day out of there. We have, according to some sources, as much as 500 years supply of natural gas if we can drill in those areas where natural gas is supposed to be. Uh, we can drill off the continental shelf 100 miles out, 90 miles out, and get an awful lot of energy that will keep us from depending as much as we do on foreign oil. Right now, Castro, Raul now, has cut a deal with the Chinese to drill within 45 miles of the U.S. coastline because their territorial uh, possession, if you will, goes out halfway between us and, uh, and uh, Cuba. So if they drill 40 miles out from Cuba, that's within uh, 50 miles of the United States, and they'll be drilling into our oil reserves because those oil reserves aren't just contained in one small spot. They spread out. 
And uh, so they'll be drilling into oil that we could be getting to become more energy independent in the short run on uh, combustible and on, uh, on uh, fossil fuels. And we can't even drill 90 miles or 100 miles out. It just doesn't make any sense, especially when we see ourselves becoming more and more dependent on foreign energy sources. So uh, I'm anxious to hear what our what uh, the uh, panel has to say. I mean, I, I presume they've made their opening remarks, and I'll read their opening remarks. But uh, uh, I, I feel very strongly that during this transition period from fossil fuels to uh, other sources of energy is going to take time, and we ought to be more realistic. And I know my colleagues, many who are very close to the, uh, the environmental lobby, are, are re reluctant to start doing some of these things that I think are absolutely necessary if we're not to get ourselves in a real bind down the road if things break out in the Middle East. If we have a war in the Middle East, which could very well happen. If Mr. Chavez goes bananas down there, we get about 25 percent of our oil from there. If something happens in Mexico, we're up the creek without a paddle. And that's why we need to start thinking about not only uh, foreign energy sources and alternative energy sources, but what we're going to do internally to protect this country. With that, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Mr. Welch, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank the witnesses very much for your uh, excellent testimony. I missed the beginning, but I've had a chance to read, uh, read your comments. Uh, Mr. Goldman, uh, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, in an article you wrote, about, uh, unless we change our foreign policy course for the next uh, couple of decades, we're going to enrich OPEC and the producers that maintain high prices and weaken the ability of the U.S. or allies to influence these countries, which is exactly the opposite of what the goal is of most people around here. Uh, I'm wondering if you can just explain uh, in, in some detail but briefly uh, how you see uh, us developing the kind of producer-consumer compact that you also wrote about there. Sure. Um, thanks for the opportunity, Congressman. Um, let me start on the consumer side. Um, you know, consumers have an awful lot of power. The, neither the Venezuelans nor the others can, you know, can, can eat this oil. They've got to sell it to some place. They've got to sell it to refineries that can use it. So by, you know, we, we did a tremendous, ourselves a tremendous amount of good in 1975 when we formed the IEA. We pooled strategic resources. We have effectively deterred embargoes for 30 years. We pooled resources on new technologies, and we really changed, changed the market. So I think if we bring the Chinese and the Indians in in particular, we have more in common in stable prices, controlling demand, efficient vehicles in any two countries in the world. But as long as we're competing for resources on the outside, we're going to have destructive competition. So if we bring them in, that collective energy security system, make them want to be a member of the club, we can use a lot of our economic power. We can also do things like demand reciprocity. We can say, we're consuming nations. You don't give us upstream access, then we're not going to let you build an LNG plant here. We're not going to give you access to our. It's got to work both ways, and we can help ourselves that way. In dealing with producers, um, I think we need a, you know, you know, a compact, or at least to at least engage producers, although I don't think in a, in a formalized, formalized system. I think we need to point out the examples of, to use the hemispheric example, Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a country that says with an open framework that brought in foreign investment that allowed the government to make money and companies to make money, they dramatically increased their production and their prosperity. And then you look at the other models, Mexico for internal reasons, Venezuela has harsher terms for other reasons, Russia for another one, and say, you know, that way instability and disaster lies, because ultimately the price may soften. And then it'll take 10 years to build a new right. resource and or any place else. So I think that's the conversation we can have. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll kind of follow up on that, Mr. Sotero. You're from Brazil. Yes. Whereabouts? <laughs> Sao Paulo. Well, when I, when I, Sao Paulo, when yes. I, and, and, and not to get self-referent here, but when I got out of law school, I hitchhiked from Presidente Prudente to Sao Paulo to Rio, uh, that, across the Mato Grosso, and I made it. <laughs> Wonderful. You've got a nice country. <laughs> it's, it's much true. changed now. <laughs> Roads are paved now. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't then. I, they were not then. Uh, here's the question. Brazil it, it has obviously exploded. Uh, they elected, quote, a socialist uh, just before the election of uh, Lulu. The stock market uh, plunged and there was uh, great apprehension. Uh, but obviously since then, uh, Brazil has demonstrated a vibrant economy and a very powerful energy sector. And its model is somewhat different, obviously, than Venezuela uh, and Bolivia. 
And my question is, what is the model that you would describe for Brazil versus these other countries that have adopted, I gather, resource nationalism? Sir, uh, it's somewhat different in political terms from Venezuela because we are very proud of being a democracy. And President Lula is very much part of it. He's a man that uh, ran for the presidency three times lost and won a fourth time and won. So uh, the label being a socialist, he is the most left-wing person we ever elected right. for president of Brazil. He's also the first man of the people to be elected president in a very unequal society. This is very important symbolically and effective in, effect in real terms for us. So, and President Lula understood very well something that Brazilians, after living for 30 years uh, with near hyperinflation, had had enough. So, uh, bef uh, this in spite of the fact he had had a political life denouncing a lot of economic programs that to foster economic stability, in order to be elected president of that country that had conquered inflation and that was then in, 19, in 2002 in the path of economic stability, uh, the president uh, basically embraced an economic program which is uh, a classic uh, capitalist market-driven economy with obviously many problems. Uh, I would say that we have someone told about the bi business climate. This is recognized in Brazil. We have to improve a lot in the business climate in order to foster investment. Right. It is President Lula himself who recently, before introducing a bill to reform our tax system, uh, saying that you know to invest in Brazil is to be punished. So we are very aware of the problems. Brazil has an open press. All the problems we have are clearly in front of society. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's very good. Just one last question, Dr. Wal I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Walzer, uh, what's the effect if the United States drops all tariffs on Brazilian ethanol? Uh, I'm, I would actually probably defer to, to Mr. Sotero, but I, my understanding is that at this particular point, uh, Brazil is operating at fairly full capacity and is meeting sort of domestic demand. So you would begin to open up a, uh, a market for expansion. Now, I think that the, the argument is that the lands that would be cultivated uh, would not encroach upon the, uh, the Amazon, but there would be some pressures to push into potentially uh, sensitive environmental areas. And other than that, I'm afraid my expertise does not carry me much further, so I don't want to yeah. venture down uh, the road. Dr. Can, could I? Add sure. something. Yeah, go ahead. It is not uh, uh, the worst thing the United States could do is to suddenly open up because this would probably disorganize our internal market. We produce ethanol mainly for internal use, for domestic use in Brazil. We can produce much more, and this is important to do this in a cooperative engagement. There are ways that you can continue to. Uh, improve your production of corn ethanol, produce the, the, the productivity of that. Actually, uh, Senator Luger proposed some ideas in a bill that she, he introduced, I believe, last year, which are to, for instance, make the subsidy vary according to oil prices and make the subsidy, the tariff, actually a stabilizer of prices in the American market. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but, you know, actually, Brazilian members of the Brazilian industry welcome the efforts in the United States to create a market for ethanol here. Uh, we just uh, wanted, and that's what they keep saying, that Americans get more creative in the way you apply the policy to develop the sector in Brazil in a way that could allow Brazilian ethanol, and ethanol not only from Brazil, from other places, including the Caribbean, including from other Thank areas, to come to yeah. the United States. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Yeah, I asked uh, generally for the panel here. You, you, the premise of this hearing was that there was a lot we could do within this hemisphere uh, if we started cooperating. We, and we looked at everybody's strengths and tried to work in, in a manner that maximized everybody's strengths a, on that. So let me ask each of you, next president coming in, what would the advice be in terms of trying to reach out, understanding the differences of uh, the different political uh, situations in this country? How would we go about 
try to find some cooperative way to maximize each country's strength to the benefit of their neighbors. If everybody keeps it to a, a minute and <laughs> a few right. seconds, we can, I'll take we can the first do this minute. whole panel. Um, well, I think, um, let me s start with structures and then policies. I mean, I think the first thing we need to do is go back to, to engaging at a senior level um, all the countries to hear their agenda as well as ours. We had the Summit of the Americas process. We used to meet at the foreign minister level, but also justice ministers and things like that. We talked to countries about both of our agendas. So I would resume that. It's a sign of respect. It's also a way to hear what the concerns are. Second, I would revive the, the trade agenda, and, and I think we will have our own spin on it, I think, in, you know, in a new administration in terms of environmental and labor standards, but I think the culture has changed in Latin America on that as well. So we have something to put on, on the table. Um, I think third, um, I think we ought to have a serious conversation about poverty and social exclusion and what we can do. It's not an American problem to fix, but there are certain ways that we can help build civil societies, that we can build structures, lessons we've learned. Just paying respect to that issue, I think, would help help an awful lot. Um, and I think that will pay dividends on, dividends on bilateral policy, because if we have a good relationship with Brazil and a respectful relationship with Argentina, then if we want to talk about the, the Venezuelan model and why our model is better, our model is better economically, socially, politically, or whatever it is, then we've got regional partners to talk to, and they, they can have that conversation in the hemisphere. And that's a much better strategy than the United States just waving its stick. So I'd start Thank there. You, Mr. Yes, uh, I would say along the same lines, in case of Brazil, what is important is to engage with Brazil. It's something that has to be said about this administration uh, that is, in, in terms of in the case of Brazil, uh, the Bush administration did very well to Brazil. It, what it engaged, it was interesting that a very conservative leader of the United States, a very left-wing leader of Brazil, recognized that the common interests of those countries were convergent uh, and started at least this initiative on biofuels that's very important. In Brazil, uh, we are aware of our social problems. Uh, there is, and I have been saying this for, for, for years, we recognize that there is nothing you have to do to help us solve our social problems that we don't have to do first. It's very clear, and we are making progress in, on that front in Brazil. But I think an agenda that really is inclusive, that is, uh, uh, takes, makes the social policy for uh, the region a central uh, uh, element, and that differentiate between countries. Countries in Latin America, uh, the, the notion, we actually in Brazil, we don't even use much the notion of Latin America. We, we say, our diplomats like to say that this is a French concept. Uh, we are in South America. We are individual countries. We have different needs. Uh, Brazil uh, can solve many of its own problems. It's a matter of allocation of resources. And uh, <coughs> we fight this in Congress, like you do here. Uh, but I think a more, uh, a more open attitude and an attitude that avoids something that has been natural throughout the years from America to avoid uh, uh, this patronizing view of Latin America. Uh, Latin America doesn't, you know, the region doesn't need that. We need uh, partners, and in the case of Brazil, clearly, and on energy, we are not asking you to do anything for us. We are working together. We can work with you. We can contribute. And again, on oil, the same thing. Petrobras, which, which is in 25 countries, including the United States, it operates here. Right. Uh, is also a company that, uh, and other companies, other many Brazilian companies that are here now. But uh, in general, I think that, uh, I think it's a mental change, uh, a mentality change that has to happen in the United States and uh, see us as uh, neighbors and partners. Thank you. Doctor. Uh, I would see sort of four basic points continuing to advance the free trade agenda. I don't think we, it's time to back off on NAFTA commitments or to review them. Uh, I think we have to move forward on free trade. I think it would be useful if the new administration would try to pull together the various sorts of strands into a kind of comprehensive uh, educational health and poverty alleviation initiative uh, that would be tangible, that would have broad uh, bipartisan support, with the goal being to develop human capital uh, in the Western Hemisphere for sort of global competitiveness. Uh, continue to sustain uh, the Millennium Challenge account, 
And I think the fourth area where uh, Latin America may be very interested in our assistance is dealing with security issues, particularly uh, the continuing threat of drugs and the rising threat of gangs and lawlessness that affect many areas from Brazil to Central America to Mexico. Showing some uh, understanding for the, this basic security problem, maybe use it, utilizing our military assets in, in different and creative ways uh, could show continued U.S. engagement in the hemisphere. Thank you. Mr. Ponsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I completely agree that engagement should be the watchword uh, in terms of our relations with the hemisphere. I think if you ask Latin and Caribbean leaders uh, what benefit they get from a close relationship with the United States, a lot of them will have to pause and think about it for a minute. But if you ask some of those same leaders, what benefit do you get from a partnership, for example, with Venezuela or other countries, they can immediately give you answers. Now, that's not to say we agree with that model, but it is to say that I think the United States, for a period of time, has been very good about asking or presenting an agenda that we have, and they're very important national security issues that we have, but not doing such a good job of listening to what the agenda may be from the Western Hemisphere countries themselves. And when we do listen, we don't necessarily deliver on what their requests are. It doesn't mean we have to give everything that's requested. Some things will be impossible or impractical or, frankly, against our own interests. But I think we need to start by changing the tone of the relationship. The word partnership has been used. The word uh, in terms of building um, a true understanding of a mutual agenda, I think that's exactly right. And we're not going to agree with all the countries all the time in the Western Hemisphere. But for example, energy uh, is one area where we can clo collaborate closely with some countries. And that's to all of our benefit. In other areas, trade has been mentioned. But for for example, uh, the, the Congress just uh, renewed the Andean trade preferences for all four countries, which I think is marvelous. I mean, you even have two countries that were part of that, uh, which strongly disagree with the United States, Ecuador and Bolivia, and yet we're reaching out, we're engaging, and we're continuing to have dialogue, even when we strongly disagree with a number of things that those countries are doing. Uh, and so I think that, that should be the watchword. I also think it would be, frankly, a, um, a real setback for U.S. interests in the region if we don't deliver on the things we've already committed to delivering, uh, particularly the Colombia and Panama trade agreements, and I think it would also be a real opportunity missed if we don't move forward in support of the uh, Mexican government with the Merida initiative. So I would start there. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for that. I mean, the, the premise being that uh, energy would be one good area that we should all find some agreement on as opposed to uh, something to fight about. But <laughs> Mr. Shays, recognize. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of you being here. Let me ask you first a, a more generic question. Why is the claim that the world uh, has peaked in oil when there are so many parts of the world ha that have not yet been, been uh, uh, examined? Um, and so tell me that. Well, the, uh, the peak oil theory uh, um, looks at the size of fields that we have known about over years and said that basically if you look back over the, 20 <coughs> the last 20 years, the huge giant fields, we've only discovered really one, I think it's Kashagan in the Caspian. You know, and so it, they, they think that, that while the reserves are there, these big large fields have been drained. The other fact that we're dealing with is the unknown, which is that really only in Western countries are reserves actually audited. And so you have people like Matt Simmons who look at Saudi Arabia and say they haven't had a real audit. And if you look at the amount of money that they're spending trying to squeeze the last drop of oil out of some of the existing reserves, it's really kind of worrisome because if you've got all this other oil, why would you be spending that much money when you can put a straw on the ground and take it out for $3? So it's a combination of the lack of transparency the, 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 the sort of the pattern of discoveries have been made, and they say that not that the uh, that that basically we have you know we have peaked in terms of production, but we've still got a long way to go. I think you it's belied by you all basically things. agree with that answer. Any anything to add? <coughs> um, with regard to, um, I mean, I think the biggest tragedy that's befalled us this uh, century has been that after September 11th, I think the president had a magnificent opportunity to say we're going to be energy independent. Uh, and he would have said to me, uh, you're going to get what you want, conservation, but I want nuclear power. I want to mine the, the, uh, the slopes out on the outer continental shelf of the Atlantic Ocean. And we, would have, and we would have had alternative sources and so on. It would have been everybody giving a little and getting a lot in return. Um, and I would disagree, I think, uh, uh, pretty strong with the Heritage Foundation. I think you have to have government intervention. Uh, I otherwise, you know, the President said to me uh, a number of years ago, he said, I was asking about conservation, he said, 
the market will get us there. But the market I is not getting us there. And I look at Toyota as the only company that, that really seemed to, to look at better ways to deal with the energy challenge. Let me um, ask you, give me a redeeming quality of Mr. Chavez. Chavez. I mean, uh, my view was that we went after him big time uh, and, so, and failed, uh, and so clearly we have an enemy. Uh, but was there ever a point in the relationship where we could have had a decent relationship with him had we not targeted him? Or was there no way but to target him, one? And number two, just tell me, and I'll start with you, Mr. Farnsworth, tell me uh, some redeeming qualities about his leadership and, and the good that he might be able to do for the hemisphere. Well, absolutely. Um, <coughs> on the theory that is no human is all good or all bad. <laughs> it's on. Thank you, sir. I, um, I think that uh, a redeeming quality of Mr. Chavez is that he is uh, genuinely concerned with the well-being of his people. I really believe that he is concerned, I'm sorry, I, I believe he is concerned with uh, poverty and underdevelopment. I really believe that. I don't necessarily think he's addressing it in the appropriate way, and I don't think what he's doing outside of his borders is appropriate in any way. But having said that, I believe that's one redeeming quality, and to the extent that those issues are firmly put on the agenda because they are relevant for Latin America more broadly, that's not a bad thing. These issues need to be addressed because if they're not, we see what's been happening through some countries in the Andes, which is that governments are elected to power and they're trying to respond to the needs of their people as they view them, and they take policy actions that may be against the policy interests of the United States. And so there is a very real strategic component for the United States to be active in supporting and, and partnering with countries in the region to address some of these social development issues. Uh, <coughs> a comment, I, clearly the April 2002 was seen as a, as a turning point. I was not involved with Latin American affairs at the time. I have talked with a number of people who are policymakers, and I'm sure that members of Congress have had even further briefs. Uh, the argument is that he was not a target of any U.S. operation, that in fact he had received warnings. Uh, I no, I don't, I, I don't mean that we were looking to assassinate him, but yeah. we actively tried to defeat him. I yeah. should have uh, clarified that. No, I think, and, and clearly what he played upon was the, uh, was our not embracing immediately the Democratic Charter and the, and supporting uh, a democratically elected head of government. So, but that's, but I think that did constitute a turning point in which he has drawn in, on, a, on a deep, sort of sense of anti-Americanism, his Bolivarian uh, program leads him ultimately to sort of clashing with the U.S. On his redeeming side, uh, he represents, uh, yes, his social aspirations uh, for the marginalized people. He also represents a large uh, racial group, either mestizo or indigenous, who have not been included in the politics of many of the countries in the Andes, uh, and he has wide resonance uh, because he is different. He is not like the traditional elites. And clearly the elites of Latin America uh, still control much of the politics and are really have to sort of confront uh, the social realities of their own countries in the future. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I agree with the, uh, uh, that that's the redeeming quality of Chavez. Uh, obviously, we in Brazil, in general, I wanted to inf tell you, uh, he's not popular at all. He's one of the most unpopular leaders of the hemisphere in Brazil. Uh, he reminds us of something we had before, which is the military figure in government. We don't like it. We fought to defeat that. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of the missed opportunity, I think was precisely that oh, April 12th, uh, episode in which, uh, uh, by coincidence, the leaders of Latin America of the region were meeting in Costa Rica that day or the day after, and uh, they all said this is a coup and this is against the charter, the democratic charter, and believe me, when a, ma a Latin America tells you this is a coup, take us seriously because we have seen them all. And uh, unfortunately, the United States did not act immediately. Uh, Secretary Powell, I believe, was, was traveling in the Middle East. He came back to Washington a few days later, went 
to the OAS ministerial meeting there and finally declare the U.S. position denouncing the coup. That was too late. Uh, it, but that was a missed opportunity because had the United States sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, denounced the coup, uh, I think you would have uh, preempted a lot of uh, Mr. Chavez's uh, behavior. And uh, later on in the administration, I think uh, the lesson was learned that instead of answering to every provocation uh, by Mr. Chavez, uh, the administration uh, kept silence. And because Mr. Chavez is a type of leader, precisely now when he is in a weaker position, that he lives off of the microphone. That's what he needs. Actually, the other day, in an episode between Colombia and Ecuador, a very <laughs> tragic episode, uh, he uh, immediately jumped in and started promoting more conflict. And the countries of the hemisphere meeting at the OAS counteracted. And uh, one, of the, one of the end results, and Brazil was very much part of that, was to isolate Mr. Chavez from the problem, isolate the problem and deal with the problem. Venezuela is not part of the group of countries that is now managing the situation and will propose a solution. If I can add to that, um, uh, on the first part of the question, I think 1998 to 2000, at least the time that I was in government, we had very civil relationship with, uh, with Venezuela. I mean, although the State Department, I think, formally had supported the other side, Ch you know, when, when President Chavez was campaigning, I think there were only two minor people at the State Department who were willing to see his team. But we had pretty civil discussions, and I was the principal coordinator with Bernardo Alvarez, now the ambassador, but then the deputy minister. And we talked about energy, uh, and, and they were at the process of basically having the government get control over the national oil company, something we preach in other countries, but, but uh, we, had, we had problems with the style in which Venezuela did it. And we disagreed, I would say, on eight out of ten of the items on the agenda, and we did it pretty openly and with a pretty big team, but it was a very open civil discussion. It's like, we don't think this is the right way to go. We don't think this is going to be good. You don't think you're going to get investment here. We need better data. But we had a very civil, very normal, normal conversation, and we had it pretty often. So we had a good sense of where the other side was. There was a dialogue. There was investments going on. And they were responsive to, to U.S. investment projects there. Uh, so I thought it was pretty civil. And I think April, April uh, that, that, was, uh, that was damaging. Um, I think the th three positive things I would say that, uh, about President Chavez, one is that he does spend the oil money on his people. You know, I spent a lot of time in sub-Saharan Africa working on those issues. I mean, that's what we're trying to get those governments to do. Is it political? Sure. Is it wasteful? Probably. But, you know, but it's happening, and that is at least a good thing. Having a government have control over the national oil company so the government policy dictates things is an orthodoxy we preach everywhere. If Pemex was sort of, you know, in revolt against the Mexican government, there's no way we would be siding with Pemex. You know, we want the government to get control over its resources. Now, we'd run that policy in a whole different way. But in the theory that governments ought to control, you know, state-owned enterprises, that was pretty sensible. And there was an awful lot of corruption in the Venezuelan system. There, there was another one of these council studies, you know, it says there's been sort of negotiated democracy in Venezuela for years. There was huge corruption, poor distribution. I mean, the, you know, the old regime was pretty bad also. And so there were legitimate issues that President Chavez took up. So he had the right agenda. But it has been done in a way that is completely unnecessary, gratuitous, and has been, you know, I think, you know, you know repressive on the press and in democracy in a way that, frankly, given President Chavez's popularity, he never needed to do, and that has engendered in a tremendous backlash. But I would say for the future, for the next administration or for whatever, I think it is possible for us to repair our relationship with Venezuela, and I think if we can keep the United States out of the middle of Venezuelan politics, the Venezuelan people still have power, mm -hmm. they still have voice, and it's our job to make sure and to speak up if their voice is trampled on. But I think Venezuela has the potential to evolve as long as we don't make ourselves you know, the, basically the center of their politics and the way in which people can campaign uh, to stay in power because we're the boogeyman. Thank you. It's amazing how we keep relearning that lesson, whether it's Pakistan or Venezuela, <laughs> isn't it? Mr. Lynch, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. We've he seen a lot of, uh, well, we've, we've uh, had a lot of talk about engagement and cooperation, which, which I agree is important. But, uh, uh, Mr. Goldwyn, you, you also referenced in your written, written testimony uh, the challenge with Venezuela, and uh, you advocate for, quote, an objective assessment uh, as to whether Venezuela's actions are undermining any other important U.S. security interests. Uh, there have been some uh, very recent reports in the Washington Post 
and in other publications uh, regarding the question of whether uh, Mr. Chavez is, is possibly funding uh, FARC. And uh, that would truly present a U.S. security interest uh, matter. Um, if, this, if this link is confirmed, and it does not look good, uh, if this link is confirmed, uh, what do you think uh, our response should be? I know you're calling for engagement and uh, cooperation, but um, if, if, if Mr. Chavez is, is actively supporting and funding a terrorist organization, as, as labeled by the United States and Europe, uh, how should that affect our, our policies towards Venezuela and, and the, the other relationships that you, you spoke of? I've seen those, those reports, and if they're true, that's a very serious, serious allegation. And our objective is to get, uh, if it is true, is to get Venezuela to stop. I think diplomatically, the way I would do that is not to, you know, not for the United States to, to put itself in the center and basically point, you know, say we're going to start imposing sanctions on Venezuela. I'd start with the Colombians; they're the ones who are directly affected. I'd go to the neighbors and saying, you know, if this is if this is true supporting these kinds of insurgencies is certainly, you know, inimical to the interests of all the countries of the region. I'd go to the OAS third and say, you've just issued a statement where Colombia apologized for crossing the border, but Venezuela and every other country agreed that it's completely inappropriate to be giving safe harbor and comfort mm -hmm. to terrorist organizations. And I would try and work diplomatically through the region, through regional leaders, to get them to stop, because that's the real objective. If that fails, or if we can't get regional support for this initiative, I think then you look at stronger measures. But I think the idea is to hold countries accountable to their neighbors first. And I think we saw a great example in this conflict between Colombia and Ecuador, where President Chavez jumped into the middle of it. But in fact, Colombia and Ecuador worked this out. And they did it both bilaterally, and they did it multilaterally. And the fact that we were had a position, but we stayed on the sidelines, facilitated the expeditious resolution. Of that, of, that, of that conflict. So I think we need to keep that in mind. We just need a little bit of nuance in how we get there. But in terms of the gravity of the accusation, I agree with you completely, and that is a prime example of something where U.S. security, our support, our support for Colombia, probably our advisors down there are, are implicated. Uh, can Mr. I Sotero? just add something about this? It's, it, it, it would be probably important to understand, for instance, where Brazil would place itself in this. Sure. What conditions the government's position in this, vis-a-vis -vis the Colombia, Ecuador issue, and Venezuela, is the impact of drug trafficking, organized crime in our society. And we know for a fact in Brazil that some of that has directly connections with the FARC. The masterminder, the main drug lord in Brazil, was arrested by the Colombians in FARC-controlled territory and sent to Brazil. So when we act in Brazil, and it's more and more clear to Brazilian society that we are going to have to take a stand uh, about uh, the actions of FARC that uh, was once a guerrilla movement, a social movement, etc., but has uh, deteriorated basically into an organization that uh, is involved in narco trafficking, in kidnapping of people, etc. So this issue is very important. I totally agree with Mr. Golden in this. To in the engagement should go in that direction because Brazilian society is fed up with crime, and we know that crime in big cities, in major cities in Brazil, has, is directly connected to narco trafficking coming from the Andean region. Mr. Waz, Dr. Waz. <coughs> it's without doubt that uh, Chavez is offering sort of moral and political support uh, for the FARC, uh, beginning with his engagement in the humanitarian uh, uh, exchange process for which he was invited to unparticipate uh, through the exchange of or the release of six different hostages. Increasingly, he became strident in his moral and political support, uh, raising them from a narco-terrorist group to a belligerent force, what he called uh, a, uh, a revolutionary force fighting doctor, the Bolivarian if you could, cause. Doctor, I, I just, I'm interested, I, I understand those yeah. facts. I, okay. I've been following very closely. I, I just want to know what you suggest our response might be to that. I, I would agree with my colleagues at this particular point, a direct response is, uh, does not appear appropriate. I think that it is reminding our uh, leaders in the region, such as Brazil, the importance that if you don't want borders violated by other armed forces, 
you also have to not allow hostile forces, terrorist groups, uh, even revolutionary insurgencies to uh, take safe haven in your own country, and particularly in Venezuela. So it's up to regional players to uh, remind uh, Chavez of his responsibilities. I think it is up to us to try to use our intelligence capabilities, uh, uh, our capacity in information gathering and monitoring drug traffic to, to help bolster uh, the case and to truly try to understand as much as possible what is going on in an opaque environment such as Venezuela. Good. Uh, Mr. Fosworth, if you could, quickly. Th thank you very much. Very quickly, I, I think we first need to establish the facts on the ground. Uh, we've seen the press reports, but we need to see exactly what was in those computers and uh, source those appropriately. I believe that's being done now. But uh, in the interim, I agree completely. Uh, the United States should not be the middle of this story. The United States should be uh, ensuring that we stay out. Venezuela it should be in the headlines here. And I think the steps that we can take with our regional partners, I think, are very positive. But let me add one additional element, if I can, and that's on the energy side, because Venezuela, of course, has massive resources, and it's through the energy well that uh, President Chavez is able to conduct some of these activities. And I think this is particularly uh, why uh, we believe that cooperation with other countries in the region on energy is so strategically important. Yes, it provides alternatives for the United States in terms of our own energy needs, but it also provides alternatives for the region in terms of their strategic needs. So they don't have to, de they don't have to depend necessarily on the largesse of uh, folks like uh, fo uh, the President of Venezuela. Uh, the relationship we're developing with Brazil, again, I come back to, which is very, very positive because it's bringing in some of the smaller states in the Caribbean and Central America which have no production capacity of, of oil and gas on their own, and yet uh, they're brought into this energy equation in a very productive and positive way. So these are issues where we can collaborate with willing partners, uh, produce a positive model and a positive agenda, and I think over the long term we'll have very positive results. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Burton, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Chavez uh, has been, according to the information we found on that hard drive or was found by the Colombian government, has been working with the FARC since 1992. And I can't believe that Colombia would be lying about what they found on that hard drive. And Chavez has, been give, has given FARC uh, $300 million. In addition to that, he's exported uh, his philosophy of government to Ecuador, tried to in Peru, in Nicaragua. And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to do what Che Guevara couldn't do uh, back when uh, uh, Cuba was moving toward revolutionizing all of Central and South America. Uh, and I'm concerned about uh, all of that. But uh, I'm more concerned, and, and, and you know, Colombia uh, is an ally of the United States, and they've been doing a great job. President Uribe has been doing a great job down there. And, uh, uh, and I do agree with you that we ought to push for the free trade agreements and the, the ex extensions that we just uh, passed. We should have that free trade agreement for Colombia very quickly uh, because I think all that. And I do also agree with you that we shouldn't be the central uh, figure in trying to deal with these problems down there. The OAS and other organizations should be doing the job and we should just be in a support ma uh, mode because nobody likes Big Brother telling everybody else what to do. So I agree with all that. My big concern is if all hell breaks loose down there and all the people in Venezuela do not like this guy. I was chairman of Western Hemisphere for a long time and I'm senior Republican on that committee now. And I have people coming to my office all the time from the business community and uh, people who have, uh, have been uh, uh, hurt by the Chavez uh, uh, movement and uh, their rights have been uh, shortened and or removed entirely by uh, their political uh, approaches down there. So the people down there aren't thrilled with him. I know he's giving money to some parts of the country where they haven't had health care or education for a long time, and I think he does that more for political support than anything else. But the thing that concerns me, and I, you can comment on this, is what does the United States do if there is a problem down there? Let's say that he goes into uh, uh, Colombia and with Ecuador and uh, or, or some, some way a spark is, uh, takes place and we have an ignition down there and we have a war. And uh, the ability for the United States to get energy from there is diminished. Right now we've got gasoline that could go up to $4 or $5 a gallon 
and uh, the impact on our economy is pretty evident. If we have a cut in supply from uh, uh, Venezuela or the Middle East, if things go awry over there, uh, you know, uh, uh, Iran's trying to develop a nuclear program, they threatened Israel, and Israel isn't going to stand by and let that happen. So if we had a conflict arise, uh, occur in the Middle East and in uh, uh, South America, i.e. Uh, between Colombia and Brazil and Ecuador and other countries down there, what do you think the United States would do as far as our uh, energy resources? Right now, it has been said by many that if that occurred, we wouldn't have an alternative strategy other than to use our emergency supply of oil that we have until it runs out. And then we'd be at the, uh, at the mercy of these folks whose oil we're not going to be able to get. And, and it's not just oil for gasoline. It's oil for creating energy, electricity, uh, for a whole host of things, making plastics, all kinds of things that we need to survive as a, as a country. And so uh, in a worst case scenario, what do you think the United States should do to protect ourselves against uh, uh, severe problems that take place in Central America, South America, and uh, in the Middle East? We have had those problems already in the Middle East. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. We, we don't think that's going to happen again, but it could. We could have a problem uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, South America. Uh, we've had problems. Communists took over uh, a number of countries, and they were moving toward revolution all over that place down there. And uh, we moved toward democracy, and, and uh, under Reagan, we were able to democratize all of those countries. But it appears as though there's countries moving to the left down there now. So the, my question is very simple. What should the United States do to protect itself against cataclysmic things that might occur in the Middle East and in South America where we get a great deal of our energy? And how do we protect ourselves? If I can take the first shot at that one. I guess first, I would say, <clears throat> in terms of Venezuela, that's an extremely unlikely scenario. I think even as we saw with the, uh, with the strike down there um, you know, in, uh, in, I think, 2002, uh, the, um, you know, Venezuela needs its own uh, its own energy resources. It can it can it can spend down its reserves for a while, but a deliberate move by Venezuela to basically cut off uh, exports, I think, is unlikely. But what should we do if we Excuse were going to? Excuse me. I mean, uh, <coughs> in a worst case scenario, because nobody has a crystal ball. In a worst case scenario, worst say case all scenario, Venezuelan what? supply comes off the market. Well, or it's reduced dramatically, and we have a huge reduction from the Middle East, and it impacts it impacts on our economy. So what, what should the United States do to protect itself against that? <clears throat> we would activate, I mean, we, we, we planned for this kind of a catastrophe in 1975, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss at all the, uh, not only the United States Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but we built <clears throat> through the International Energy Agency a coordinated emergency response mechanism, which means we convene all of these consuming countries. We all agree to an immediate stock draw, which is a way of showing the market that there are huge supplies close to markets here in the United States that we can release that can completely release, replace Venezuelan supply and Venezuelan supply and some others for a significant amount of time. So that's step one, is we do a stock draw. Step two is we, we implement some, some demand, demand conservation measures. Countries like Canada tend to go to demand conservation before a stock draw. Third, we free up things like suspending the Jones Act so we can allow the different kinds of oil to come in. We probably release some of our own uh, domestic fuel standards so that kind of gasoline that's only appropriate in Chicago can be used in California, so essentially we make our, our market a little bit more liquid. Probably before all of those, we would go to existing suppliers, and we're back to the Saudis, people who have uh, excess capacity, which is defined by the IEA as supply they can put on in 90 days, and get them to release some of their commercial stocks. And then that triggers, uh, all of these actions trigger uh, an action by other producers to start ramping up production to try and grab a piece of that market. <coughs> the other thing we would do, frankly, is, is do what we didn't do on September 12th, is we would probably go back to people and say, we need to be doing an awful lot more in terms of getting ourselves, transforming our economy to get off of oil, and then we might look at legislation. I, personally, I'd come back to Congress and say, now's the time, you know, to look at significantly higher fuel efficiency standards, a way to, you know, to look at measures to change the transportation system. Long term, this may happen one way or the other. We need to change the transportation paradigm and not wait for a crisis to occur. But if it does occur, we have planned for this and we could deploy immediately to, to ameliorate the, the most significant economic effects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burton. 
And I, I think the other point would be if there were actual military aggression, had Chavez's forces crossed into Colombia for an action, then I think we would have seen a very different scenario in which the United States should have been prepared to support uh, an ally, at least with, and I was thinking, what I thought of was, is he going to exercise the Galtieri option? Is he going to play his own sort of Falklands there? But uh, he clearly backed off fairly quickly uh, last uh, Friday. So there is a scenario, as you mentioned, for potential military aggression, but I would not say it's a, a likely one at this time, and I think the, the evidence of the last week is that it's, it hopefully will not replay itself. If I might make one, one, one more comment, uh, I, not a question. I hope you're all right, <laughs> and if we ever do have that kind of a problem, and it's gone, it goes on for an extensive period of time, the economic chaos that would occur in this country would be severe, and we need to plan and move toward energy independence and not rely on foreign sources as much as we do. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Welch. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the themes that uh, each of you is presenting, I think, is that it's better for us to be engaged uh, than to be confrontational, uh, and that within Latin America, the countries that are engaged uh, rather than have a kind of populist confrontational uh, approach to politics seems to work better. And two questions, and maybe each of you can just address it very, very briefly because uh, we have five minutes, but what would you identify in the United States as the impediments to us to adopting a policy of engagement which requires obviously a certain amount of restraint when what are considered by many here to be provocative actions incite us to be confrontational. And on the other hand, what are those constraints uh, in countries, say, like Venezuela, where they choose confrontation uh, in their relations with us over uh, some type of cooperation? So just very briefly, what are the things we've got to do in this country to move towards cooperation in, in Latin America like the same? And I, I'd really like to hear briefly each of you respond to that. And I'll start with you, Mr. Golden. Skilled leadership and pay attention. <laughs> Skilled leadership and there really is There really is no impediment. We just have to have people who are charged with diplomacy, who know something about the region, pay attention to it, invest their time in it, uh, and, and follow this policy. I mean, there really is no impediment to this. We just haven't, other things have crowded Latin America off the agenda, and sometimes particular political interests or constituencies have a disproportionate influence over the people who get those jobs in the right. State Department. So Thank just, you. just skilled leaders. Mr. Sir, Sotero? Uh, you know, understanding the issues in its complexity, in their complexity, and uh, uh, in the case of Brazil, one major constraint in the whole dialogue has been for years now uh, all subject on trade negotiations, which, uh, you know, maybe now it's the opportunity with commodity prices this high. Uh, maybe the American taxpayer doesn't need to spend this much of public money to support uh, the farm sector. You could be much more selective on what you do here, and that could unlock, for instance, uh, the, uh, the Doha round and get a lot of goodwill in Brazil. Brazilians like to engage the United States. There are 400 on plus American companies in Brazil. They have been there forever. Amer Brazilians think mm -hmm. that Ford, Ford and, Sh and, and, and GM are Brazilian companies. Uh, so there is this, uh, I it's, uh, again, you know, stay focused, pay attention, uh, keep uh, diplomats and people highly skilled, highly knowledgeable about uh, the region. And uh, another example, you know, uh, uh, something, a simple example of something that could do wonders to Brazil-U.S. relations, uh, uh, re-engage in a negotiations of a tax treaty with Brazil. A tax treaty between Brazil and the United States will probably do more to bilateral relationships, to bilateral engagement than okay. any trade agreement uh, in the foreseeable <coughs> future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walzer. I think the biggest challenge will be to continue to grow Latin America, to move beyond the commodities boom, to uh, get stable and sustainable growth that uh, we can carry out into the next decades. I think that the biggest challenge, the biggest constraint are developing Latin America's democratic institutions so that they truly deliver the democratic benefit. Uh, the problem we have is that uh, we have uh, said that if you vote, you're going to have a better government. 
Well, that doesn't necessarily mean the case. Latin Americans vote, but they don't necessarily get better governance. Somehow or another, that institutional barrier, those, those uh, political bodies that have stood in the way of genuine reform have to be overhauled. Thank you. I, I, would, I would agree uh, very much with your uh, comment that indeed with Latin America, uh, engagement works a lot better than confrontation and there are long historical reasons for that which we need not go into, but I think as a general approach that works. I think to the extent that there are times when the United States finds itself needing to do something more directly or perhaps um, uh, more quickly, to the extent we have already developed a reservoir of goodwill with our friends and allies in the region that can be called on to support us in those times of need, I think that's very good. And that has to start with an engagement now when times aren't necessarily bad so that we develop right. those strong relations. And the last point I would make on that is um, the one thing we really haven't discussed today uh, is the whole idea of people-to-people -people exchanges. I mean, the number of folks mm -hmm. between North America and Latin America that are going back and forth are, I is immense. And that, in some ways, is the best way to develop the relations with the neighbors to the south, with one exception, and that is that uh, given uh, the changed security paradigm in the United States since uh, September 11 uh, and the, the um, appropriate uh, changes that have occurred. Nonetheless, the view from Latin America, from students and visiting professionals and people who, who normally would simply travel to the United States and develop those relationships has been that well, maybe it's a little bit more, more uh, pain than it's worth. So they go to Europe or they go to Africa or they go to Asia. And so we're losing a whole cadre of emerging leaders from the region that we normally would have taken for granted as a developing relationship with the, with the whole region. So to the extent that we can concentrate on things like increased Fulbrights, increased visitors exchange programs, increased uh, cultural uh, activities, I think that would be a very, very good place to, uh, to consider. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Shays. Uh, two questions. First, uh, I'm stunned when the United States gets so actively involved in another country's election because if it was in reverse, if Venezuela told me that I should support Barack Obama or or, or John McCain or Hillary Clinton, I would probably do the exact opposite, I mean, if it was so aggressive. So tell me, um, why do we think that somehow our getting involved in their elections uh, will get the result we want? Well, sure. Let me Still just the <laughs> say something as, as a Latin America. Uh, in, in Brazil, really what you think about our election really doesn't matter much. We are going to vote the way we are yeah. going to vote. Like, I believe it's exactly the same way Americans think and should think. So, uh, in general, but Brazil is a very big country. In other countries, I think that you're right in your assessment. Maybe by declaring your support to this or that, well, identifying, you, you produce the opposite, you, you, you energize the opposition right. to that person. We, we would make it illegal for you to spend money <laughs> in the United States. Is it legal for us to spend money in Venezuela or, or Brazil to, to help elect uh, uh, the candidate of our choice? No, I I in Brazil, I know it's not legal at all. I don't think that the uh, that the U.S. backs particular candidates. So you had 2000. You had in 2006. You had what was it, 11, 11 or 12 uh, elections. There was probably one where there was some apparent interpreters' interference, which was to uh, uh, in Nicaragua when uh, the embassy, I think, and Ambassador Trevelli spoke against or interpreted his statements against Daniel Ortega. Uh, I think we were, we were very studious in keeping out of the Mexican elections, very close to us, very well, contentious. I don't think we were in Venezuela. In fact, yeah. if we wanted to defeat him, we probably should have endorsed Chavez and yeah. said he was our closest friend and we've been <laughs> well, working uh, all the time with him. That's Let what I, I've always, always agreed. But I, I think that separate supporting what, I mean, uh, the, uh, both sides are doing through the NED and the NDI, RII, is supporting the institutions, right. the political process. I think that is a legitimate uh, undertaking, uh, which has been long endorsed by... As by long Isabel. as it's not partisan to favor one candidate. Mr. Right. Sotero, um, I have a number of wonderful Brazilians who live in my district who are there illegally. Mm -hmm. um, and they make uh, uh, huge arguments uh, about why they are such good citizens in the United States. But I'd love to know if I... if if um, if I went to Brazil, 
uh, and extended my visa uh, and then sought to get work in, in, um, in Brazil. What would be the attitude of the government? You would not be able to because uh, we are actually, unfortunately, very bureaucratic in the way we do things. So you would not have any of the documents necessary to get employment in Brazil. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I well, wouldn't. Wouldn't uh, wouldn't couldn't I get a, an employer to hire me illegally? Sorry, um, it's unlikely. We have some illegal immigrants from the neighboring countries, 50,000 Bolivians, um, a number of people from Colombia that live in Brazil illegally. They live in lo the informal sector, right. uh, which is very huge in Brazil because of excessive regulation. Half of new jobs created in Brazil are in the well, so co euphemistically called the informal sector. But uh, uh, I fully understand what the problem is here. There may be, according to government, Brazilian government estimates, there may be some 800,000 Brazilians living in the United States, about 83% the estimate is that they are here. Let me just say they are uh, wonderful neighbors. I mean, I mean, not next door neighbors, but, but in the community. So, but it's something we're wrestling with, and it's just, it's anyway, okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Let me um, just ask, Mexico, by most of the council who testified here today, may be out of oil in 2016. I think they gave almost 625,000, 623,000 barrels uh, to the United States. What's the impact on the United States when that happens? What's the impact on Mexico when that happens? Mr. Mr. Franklin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's a very important question. It's a very timely question. Um, I think the first, in the first instance, Mexico itself understands this. Uh, the president is a former energy minister. He's very, very capable, I believe. Uh, his energy minister is quite good. The head of Pemex is a former ambassador to Washington. They understand the issues. They understand the imperatives and the urgency. Uh, in fact, right now, the uh, administration in Mexico City is trying to work with uh, the Congress, which it doesn't control a majority, to try to get through um, legislation that would open up, in part, at least uh, some of this sector. Um, the complication is, th as you know, that this is a constitutional issue in Mexico and it's deeply ingrained in the Mexican psyche. Um, and it's not something that will be able to be changed necessarily Can until I the. Can you tell us a little bit about the constitutional provision and what might be done to it to, to sort of satisfy that psyche uh, and also get to the uh, result that you think is favorable? Yeah, why is it a constitutional issue? I don't know. It was, it was created in the Mexican Constitution uh, when the, uh, the oil sector was nationalized during the revolution in the last century. Um, and it, was, it is formed a basis of Mexico's understanding of itself as a nation. Uh, because what is they essentially did is they uh, euphemistically kicked out uh, international mm -hmm. oil companies and international investors to be able to control the national resources and to reserve the resources for the Mexican people. And so the Mexican people themselves uh, see ownership of these issues. And so it's not something that can just be changed by decree. It really has to be constitutionally reformed. And it would be like our own constitution, uh, in a certain sense, would need a, uh, that type of reform. That's the complication. Now, having said that, there may be ways to change that uh, with contracts that would allow in mm -hmm. partnerships and sharing, and I think that's what's being explored right now. And that could be a short-term solution, but ultimately, in order to get to the reserves that uh, people believe are there, particularly in the deep water of the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico needs investment management expertise and a better understanding of actually how to get to those resources which they currently don't possess. So, so I'm wondering here, because that's a real, such a short period of time, and, and constitutional changes take long periods of time. Um, and, and you answered me in part there on that. Wh what is it that we can do uh, to work with them as they work to some of these sort of informal ar arrangements, or whatever? And do you think there's no arrangement that you can envision that would allow them to both keep the psyche intact of this is our oil, but we're going to work cooperatively with other people and have them work for us to produce? More oil, Mr. Sotero. Let, let me just make let me just make one quick point, if I can be responsive to the question, because I think that that, that the it's extraordinarily complicated for the United States to be helpful in that particular mm -hmm. issue, and so working with friends and allies, for example, the Canadians who have developed a very interesting model for investment, where the Canadians themselves continue to own the resources, but have yet found a way to develop the resource and get them to market and monetize That's them. That's what I was wondering why they couldn't do that. There are models out there. Brazil has done some very interesting things. Colombia is doing things, and by bringing the parties together for discussion with the Mexican body politic, I think that could be very helpful. I, I got to tell you, I, I would assume that it's, it's very interesting for people to think they want to own their own resources. I, I think Mr. Mm -hmm. Goldman mentioned that, Goldman mentioned that earlier, is why, 
why would you argue against that, particularly with a bad history in the past of people abusing it and fraud and waste or whatever, but there's got to be some accommodation where it all works. Mr. Sotero, you well, uh, Brazil used to have a, uh, we have had a state monopoly on oil exploration. Petrobras was created in 1953 and the slogan was the oil is ours. There was the same sense of identity. Well, the oil is ours, but we understand now to take it from down there for consumption, we need partners. We don't have all the money to invest in Petrobras. We changed the model. Petrobras is controlled 55 percent by the government, but there are it, it, its share, shares are in the stock market, traded there, and we have risk contracts. Uh, there are foreign companies from all over the world working with Petrobras, as Petrobras works in 25 other countries as a Brazilian multinational company now. Now, I think it may be useful uh, for the Mexicans, and there has been contact to, to look into the Brazilian example. There may be some lessons, interesting lessons there, to make Pemex become a more efficient company. It may sound as a contradiction in terms for Americans, but I can assure you Petrobras is a state controlled company that is very, very efficient because it knows precisely in what market it operates and that market determines that it has to be an efficient company. So I believe, again, you know, maybe engagement in the hemisphere uh, can open up ways for uh, Petrobras and maybe later in the future even PDVSA to be better run. Well, they, they provide such a large part of the revenues for Mexico. You know, and if we think that we have immigration issues now, <laughs> you know, and I was expecting, Mr. Goldman, you might want to comment yeah. on that. What happens, or Mr. Dr. Wells, or both of you, what happens if that dries up and there's no other resource? Uh, the President isn't, Calderon isn't able to increase the tax situation as he's been trying to do. Uh, I would think that it becomes a, a large impetus for people to go where they can support their family somewhere. Well, it depends on, on how they react. I'm actually somewhat optimistic now that both the PRI, the party that was out, had this idea. Now that it's not in power, it's sort of against it. And the PAN now has its own. But there, there's a potential compromise there which will allow probably not U.S. companies but st other state-owned companies like, uh, like Statoil um, and like Petrobras to come in there and, and in a very limited way, experimental way, look in the Gulf. So I'm somewhat optimistic. You know, it can go two ways with a country like Mexico. You know, this oil wealth is not always great for countries. One possibility is that Mexico makes itself much more competitive for manufacturing and other kinds of business, and it sort of migrates out of the oil business. Or, or the other is it stands still and does nothing, and they just lose revenue, and then you have job loss, drop of standard of living, increased migration across the border, which is the U.S. concern. But, you know, there, there's this odd correlation between countries, you know, which don't have great oil wealth and their ability to reform their economies to make them more prosperous, you know, like the Bahrainis in the Middle East. The answer for us, though, is if Mexico declines in a significant way, we import Middle e more Middle East oil, probably a little bit more from Africa, but significantly more from the Middle I mean, East. And I'm, I'm telling you that it's not just a problem for us on immigration. It's a problem for them. They get some pretty good people, you know, innovators, uh, you know, people that, that they know enough to go someplace else and make themselves a success, they probably do a, a bang-up job staying home on that. Yeah. Anybody have any final statements? Dr. Just Wells, do you want to make a comment just on to, that? Just that it's, good, it's important to continue to grow Mexico. I mean, uh, Pemex loses 42 percent of its money to support the, the national budget. This money could be shifted, obviously, to investment if it could operate as a, as a, as a, as a basic going concern. Tax reform, uh, economic growth in Mexico could take some of the pressure off of Pemex to allow them to invest in their uh, oil exploration. Uh, but again, that's, that is a long-term challenge. Uh, sir, as, as Eric mentioned, uh, obviously the findings in of oil in Brazil uh, have still to be concretely verified. But they are very, very significant. Uh, Petrobras, as I said, is a very competent company, is the world leader in, in deep water uh, drilling. This oil is uh, in this, uh, it's five kilometers down, uh, but we already take oil from three kilometers down very well. And uh, so it's a matter of investment, uh, but uh, uh, there is, I think, uh, a lot of uh, a positive thinking going on in Brazil that uh, uh, the country could emerge in, in a framework of 10 to 15 years uh, as also a net exporter of oil, so it could be a player in that market also. Well, thank you. Let me thank all of you for your participation today. We're going to revisit this issue, and we may take a, uh, a congressional delegation down to the area mm -hmm. to talk in more detail with people. We see this as a very serious issue of security 
as well as economics. And I think the challenges are enormous, but the opportunities are even larger on Absolutely. that. And you've helped us frame that issue today. So thank each and every one of you for your participation. We, we really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Meetings adjourned. Thanks.